Well, hey, everybody, welcome to Undisciplined by Design. This is a show where we talk about the interesting ways that creative lines overlap in a world where innovation and problem solving are a part of our everyday life. Um, we're in the midst of a global pandemic and we're working to find our ways around that, but we're also seeing that um, that's birthing really new, cool, creative things and creating opportunities that maybe we didn't expect. So we're making the best of it and we're excited to be able to share the stories of people that are doing that with us. My name's Aaron, I'm the host, and I'm a faculty member at the University of Cincinnati. I teach classes on design thinking, innovation, and digital storytelling. And a lot of those stories are meeting with folks like my guest today, Adam Rosa, who is doing some really awesome things with his community and empowering kids in other communities to think about the world that they live in and the, the community that they're making for themselves and others. So um, Adam, would love to have you tell us a little bit about yourself and your story and how you got to where you are today. Absolutely. Well, it's great to be here, Aaron. Thanks for having me. Uh, this is a really interesting topic, kind of the overlap between different design disciplines. So if I go a little bit into my origin story, so I everyone is really shaped by their experiences. And I was born in Buffalo, New York uh, in the late 70s. And during my childhood, I, I saw a lot of changes going on in, in my city in Buffalo. I mean, the, uh, the factories were closing. Uh, downtown was starting to empty out. There were a lot of uh, you know shifts in the population that kind of the, the population overall was starting to sink, but you know Buffalo is really a, it's a city of good neighbors and it, it has distinct ethnic communities, but it also has significant racial segregation. So I saw a lot of that as a child and as a young person growing up, and that that helped to kind of shape and frame my my view towards cities and neighborhoods. And the other place that really helped to, sh to shape my view was uh, New York City. So. My parents were uh, they're former New Yorkers, and I spent a lot of time as a kid going to the big city. And you know, this was in the, the early to mid '80s, so I saw a lot of what was going on in New York at the time, which you know was hip hop culture and street art, and it was a really gritty and authentic place. This was uh, this was pre -Disney Disneyification of of uh, Times Square, so I remember walking through there as a kid and get get like. You know, soaking it all in and just saying like, wow, this is an amazing place. And so from there, I just, you know, I, I really was a, just became a lover of cities. And I remember as a young person, just, you know, spending my afternoons drawing maps and drawing skylines and just being fascinated by it. And I remember one day, I think I was maybe about, uh, maybe like a junior in high school. And we were doing the, the college thing where you're trying to figure out what your major is going to be and thinking about what schools uh, might be uh, good fits for you. And I remember my mother was leafing, leafing through one of those big uh, college guides. Back in the day, it was, a, it was, a, you know, it was an analog guide to colleges. Yeah. And she, she stumbled upon a major called urban planning. And she said, well, this sounds really interesting. So this might be something we want to look into. So, uh, you know, from there, I just really, really uh, explored a few different options. University of Cincinnati was a, an amazing fit for me. So I, uh, I attended school there from 1995 to 2000 in the Bachelors of Urban Planning program. And it was, uh, you know, I, I couldn't have asked for a better educational experience. And I think part of that was the integration with in the DAP program with all the, the other design disciplines where there are a lot of more traditional planning programs that are focused primarily on policy mm -hmm. and, and kind of mm -hmm. governmental issues and social issues. And at DAP, I was able, it was more of a design-based program and I was able to interact and work with people from the graphic design program and architecture and industrial design and all these different majors. And it, it kind of uh, broadened my horizons in ter terms of what we can do as as an urban planner and as an urban designer. Well, I mean, just even in what you just talked about, there's so much to unpack, right? Like, so I, I was also, I think we're close to the same age. I was growing up in the, the late seventies, early eighties there too. And I remember not so much from being in New York. I never went, went to Times Square when I was younger, but just going to the city in general, I lived out in a rural community and um, there was, there was just something, especially if that wasn't your everyday, 
that yeah, just yeah. felt kind of like different and alive about a city. And, uh, you know, I remember actually this one time going on a field trip to downtown Cincinnati and uh, we went to all these, we went to the symphony, we went to the big library and um, I don't remember what else we did, but we were supposed to afterwards draw a picture of the part that we remember the most. And everybody else is drawing like the time when we were at the symphony or when we went to the other big thing. And the part that I drew was this picture of us just walking through downtown because it was there was something same thing you're describing like oh, yeah. that was what impacted me the most was like getting to be around all of that stuff and that energy and seeing the buildings and hearing the sounds so um i think it's really cool that that actually inspired where you ultimately ended up being and how you're shaping cities now right <laughs> yeah I'm a, I'm a lucky person i get to do what i love for a profession and you know i i credit university of cincinnati for a lot of that just the you know, I love the I love the urban location of the university and the different neighborhoods around it. You know, I, I spent a lot of time just exploring those neighborhoods. You know, I, and I think the co-op program was was an amazing launching point um, into a career. So being able to have two plus years of experience coming out of school, and I was lucky enough to be hired by my last co-op in Berkeley, California, and just you know, started working right off the bat. So I never went back and got a master's degree or anything like that, which is a little bit unique, I think, these days. A lot of people in my field, you know, they feel like they need to get that master's degree and to be able to really uh, move forward. But I just jumped right into the workforce and I learned so much on the job that you don't get to in school, which is a really messy part of um, working in neighborhoods and working with communities. And you know, so so I spent my first ten years working in the in San Francisco and in Berkeley in the Bay Area, and that was a a, a, a different you know type of location, especially from where I grew up. It, it was instead of a population going down, it was a, a, a booming region, and this was this was the period of like the first dot com boom. So you know, I saw a lot of that going on in the early two thousands working in San Francisco and. Um, just again, being like surrounded by a lot of creative people, a lot of energy, but also have an opportunity to go into neighborhoods that I would not normally um, know about or, or be part of, you know, parts of Oakland, uh, you know, other areas in San Francisco. And then I had that, I had an amazing opportunity to work in uh, Honolulu, Hawaii for about, about five or six years, um, kind of commuting from San Francisco taking the, taking the jet uh, on a Monday morning and like spending a week there and then coming back. And um, so I got kind of thrust right into a, a role of being a project manager on several uh, transit oriented development projects in the city of Honolulu. So they're investing several billion dollars into this new elevated rail system that's connecting the downtown area out to the Western parts of the island. And I was able to um, work with communities in the western parts of the island, which is really the area you don't see on the postcards, okay. um, to to try to create a vision and, and um, thinking about neighborhood improvements around that potential investment of that new rail system. Hmm. So I think working in those in those areas of Honolulu, uh, where you have have heavy immigrant populations, uh, you know, very low income or working class. Uh, areas where I was absolutely an outsider really, really helped to, me to understand that how important it is to listen and learn first from communities mm -hmm. before you come in and, and try to, uh, you know, uh, provide some expertise. Yeah. So that, that, that really helped frame everything I do from here on out, um, yeah. that experience working in Hawaii. Makes sense. You know, I talk to my students a lot about the idea of the human centric design processes, you know, start by getting to know humans and immersing yes. in their environment, hearing their stories, all that. And we just actually yesterday wrapped up our semester's worth of uh, virtual innovation projects we've been doing. And um, it was so interesting to listen to them talk about the difference in having done that. And like, you know, the first two weeks of the process, specifically like forbid them from trying to come up with solutions yet like you're you know if, you, if they start coming up with solutions like nope we're putting those in the parking lot we are not going to talk about solutions until you've really yes. fallen in love with the problem and then at the end when they see what that did and get the feedback from our client too about how like oh, it feels like you really put a lot of effort into knowing us and knowing our needs that's it's, it showed up in the end product that's when you know like okay good it worked right <laughs> you know? 
Yeah, and it's it's interesting to see that approach kind of filtering down in different design disciplines because that's that's kind of how urban planning is rooted in that community engagement approach. And and you know, so I feel like over the years that 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 kind of human centered design thing is taking center stage. But even in our world of of being urban planners and urban designers, um, there's the opportunity to go so much deeper and to really develop those relationships and uh, build that trust to help really make sure that that the community is going to move forward. And that comes through empowering residents to be the champions for change. So when I start a project, you know, I'm 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 thinking about really uh, how I can soak everything up and how I can understand things. And then I don't come in as an expert, but I, I provide ideas and, and things that um, and it to kind of stimulate discussions and stimulate ideas, stimulate some, you know, bigger moves. But my whole goal is that I can step away from the project and have the, the residents of the community take center stage and be the champions and be the advocates because that's the only way that real significant improvement and change is going to occur, especially in the neighborhoods I work. Because um, the majority of communities I'm working in are are underinvested. Um, you know, I work a lot around in and around public housing throughout the country. Uh, so these are people that that have that are really just living day to day, and they are uh, m- many of them are in crisis mode, but have also never been asked. You know what they want their community to be like or how they can help shape the future. So I, I need, in my work, I need to be very humble and I need to be very understanding and, and uh, you know, I never try to try to uh, prove that I'm some sort of expert on their community. Right. So I'm there to help and I'm there to serve and I'm there to be part of their team. So that that's how I kind of approach it. Yeah. So we talked about the origin story, you know, we're talking, you know, uh, late 70s and then, you know, the the late 90s and early 2000s at, at DAP and UC. What what are you doing now? And, you know, this this is all kind of culminated knowing a little yeah. bit about reading your bio and everything. What Where is this culminated to and what are you working on these days? Yeah, so after about 20 years of working for smaller and medium sized firms in San Francisco and Denver and then in Chicago, um, I decided earlier this year to go off on my own and start my own thing and hang my own shingle and see how it goes. And that timing couldn't have been worse, obviously. It, I think I, I officially started my practice, which is called Collabo Planning and Design, right around March 1st oh of this goodness. year. Wow. Yeah. So just got thrown right into the, into the fire. But um, it actually has been going very well throughout the summer and fall. And I credit a lot of that just to the relationships that I've built over the years, not only with clients, but with other partners. Mm -hmm. So what I'm really looking to foster with my practice, and the reason why it's called Collabo is is Collabo is really about two or more people working together to achieve some success or to achieve some change. And the way that I'm kind of structuring my practice is that I I have this group of all of these amazing professionals from different design fields and different design approaches that I can tap or, or bring in to a community to help them address their challenges. So whether it's the, you know, the lack of a grocery store, which is something we hear all the time in the neighborhoods where I work, bringing in somebody who could help to do a, a market assessment for a grocery store and maybe uh, create a, a specific design for a grocery store to help recruit that, or uh, something like a, a community I was working in really lacked any parks and open space. So I, I brought in a, 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 an awesome landscape architecture firm that I work with here in Chicago called Site Design Group. And they helped augment my, my ability and really we created some implementable um, park design concepts for this, this neighborhood I was working in, in in Pennsylvania. And then the cost estimates uh, for that. So my whole practice right now is to go beyond traditional planning which is, you know, traditional planning is, all right, we listen to you, we're writing everything down, uh, we're creating that vision, it goes into a book, here's your book, you know, take it as you will, we're moving on to the next project. Mm -hmm. So what I want to be able to do is uh, have the sustainability and the longevity with communities, but to, like I said, empower them to uh, move forward, to create change, 
But also while we're doing this plan, whether it may be six months or a year or even longer, to start to create some early action as part of that process. So thinking about like the low hanging fruit where we can go out into the community, get volunteers, work together, improve something. And that is that becomes a launching point for the larger vision. So that gets people more involved, it gets them more invested. They see visible change. Yeah. Because in a lot of neighborhoods in which I serve, uh, they've been lied to a lot. They, um, they've they told the city or they've told the government what they want to see and nothing ever happens. So you get you get kind of burnt out and it, it becomes the thing like, why should we continue to engage in this type of process when we never see any results? Mm-hmm. So I, I really want to create a, a way to um, ensure that, that positive results happen in these neighborhoods. And one of the unique things that I'm doing is um, it's called the Equitable 20 Initiative, where I actually hold 20% of my design budget to the side. So if it's a $100,000 project, I'm holding $20,000 in a pot, and we're going to let the process play out. And we're, we as a group are going to figure out how to spend that $20,000. Oh, nice. Whether it's, whether it's like a physical going out and improving something right away in the community, or whether it's bringing in another expert yeah. that can help to move a project forward. Yeah. Well, I think, yeah, it speaks to this other interesting trend that I've been seeing too of um, kind of almost trying to like demystify the creative process and involve people. Like, you know, looking back 10 years ago or so, there was sort of this idea of like elevate the creative and do that in a way that creates this like hide and reveal kind of, you know, okay, we'll come in and hear what you want and then we're going to go over here and do what we can't let you see. And then we'll come back with this amazing thing. Um, And I'm seeing more and more companies and agencies and even just as you're describing this, try and do that of like, well, actually, we'll we'll bring you into it more. And then the next step of that is actually even to say, like, not only going to bring you into seeing it, so you have visibility, we'll actually empower you with the tools so that we just sort of coached you along the way part way, and then we're going to hand it to you and let you run. So I I think what's really interesting about what you're doing now is not only saying, am I going to involve you, give you the tools, we're also going to give you some of the resources, right? Like there's going to be money there to finance what you want to do. That's amazing. You know, I'm working in a neighborhood just started in, uh, in Rock Hill, South Carolina right now on a neighborhood called the, or the project's called the Clinton Connection Action Plan. And it's called Clinton Connection because it's centered on an HBCU uh, university in the center of the neighborhood, which is called Clinton College. And we're, and this is the, you know, a, a typical other side of town, other side of the tracks, all the developments going on the north part of Rock Hill, and we're trying to bring resources to this community. So the idea and what we've come up with the the neighborhood is not only thinking about a vision and a design and everything like that, but um, how do we market it and how do we uh, promote it? So we would come up with this idea or this slogan called We Got Next, because it's called called the Clinton Connection with NEXT. And so we're going to build a whole kind of approach around the We Got Next idea, which is kind of in your face, but it's in a way it's, it's authentic to the neighborhood um, because this is a this is a sports oriented town. And I would never have known that until I came in and really listened and learned from the, na- from the, the community. Apparently this is football city USA. They have more um, amateur football stars than any city of its size in America. And they have all, they're, they're, they're trying to kind of build an economy around sports. So we're trying to think about, well, how can we tap into that everything that's going on on the other side of town and bring it to this part of the community and um, create some real entrepreneurship opportunities around it. So again, it, it's really, uh, it, it starts to go beyond just physical brick and mortar design to improve communities and really gets to the quality of life approach, yeah. uh, which is so much more powerful, I think, in, in lasting uh, in terms of uh, revitalization. Yeah. Yeah, are there any, so that's a project that's in process right now. Are there any kind of previous examples that maybe even led to inspiring this Equitable 20 idea? Like you, you saw like, oh, we tried this and it worked so well. That's, this, this next idea is going to be this, you know? Yeah, yeah. So I've, I've been uh, trying to incorporate early action projects in, in my work for many years as a principal at a previous firm. And uh, we worked through the, I've done a lot of work through a federal program called HUD, it's a HUD program called Choice Neighborhoods. And Choice Neighborhoods is a HUD's kind of revitalization strategy for reinvesting in distressed public housing, but doing it in a way that 
uh, incorporates an entire neighborhood around it. And thinking about how you can, if you're going to invest in, in a particular site, what's that spinoff effect? And then what are the, the people projects and the quality of life projects that are going to um, improve, improve people's quality of life and help them reach that you know, ladder, ladder of uh, economic opportunity? So through that program, there's, there's been an opportunity to take a portion of those larger grant funds and apply them to early action. So some of the things that we've done that have been really successful, I was working in Huntington, West Virginia uh, a couple of years back, and they had a, a, uh, a vacant home in the neighborhood that was owned by a, a prominent African-American activist from the 50s, 60s, and 70s. She started the NAACP chapter in, in Huntington. Uh, her name is Memphis, Tennessee Garrison. It's one of the best names I've ever heard. So we, uh, through the project, we listened to the community and they said, you know, we really want to preserve her home, her historic home, and turn it into something that'll be great for the neighborhood. So we used some of these, these early action funds to go in and uh, start to rehab the home and bring it up to uh, a level where it would be, you know, fixing the roof and fixing the exterior where it would be sustained. And then the, the bigger vision is to turn it into an African-American history museum and cultural center for the, for the community. And that home happens to be right in the center of our larger reinvestment area where we're looking at all these different um, possibilities for affordable housing. Uh, there's, there, we're trying to, there's a proposal for an, a grocery store to come in to kind of anchor part of that area. Uh, this is only a couple of blocks from Marshall University. So we're, we're working with the university to, to really um, kind of tap into that resource and the anchor institution. But, that, but being able to, to use some funding to actually um, work on that particular project of, of restoring this historic home and bringing it back to uh, as a community asset. That's the type of thing that that gets people excited, gets people involved, and, and they want to then be part of this larger neighborhood effort. Yeah, yeah. And so, when you're trying to get the whole community, this is I'm assuming this involves people of all ages, right? I mean, this mm -hmm. is not just like oh, all the retired people want to be a part of it, or you know, all the people with kids. Like, does this span the whole generational gap too? Yeah, well, that, that's a, often a challenge is that if you a traditional planning meeting that's held at from six to eight on a Wednesday night in a, you know, a random auditorium or cafeteria somewhere, the average age of people there is probably 65 or up. Yeah. And they're the, they're the usual suspects that go to all of those types of meetings and they have the time to do it. And they're, you know, they're invested and they, they, they're the, the leaders really from the previous generation. Mm -hmm. So, one thing that I've been kind of really focused on and intentional about is uh, involving youth in the, in the planning process and trying to empower young people to be a part of it. Number one, like what is an urban planner and what do we, what do we do? It's something I didn't know about when I was 15 years old and the kids working in, in the, that are living in these communities definitely don't know that this is a something you can do. So going in and kind of like, letting them know that this is this is something like if you love your neighborhood and you want to make it better and you love cities like you can make a career out of this mm -hmm. and then really working in, in different ways whether it's young kids that are you know kindergarten to fourth grade doing really specific hands-on activities with them to help to draw out some of their ideas and feedback or if you're working with high school kids or even early college students um, they want to be involved in hands-on stuff. So if we can go out and, um, and do a project in the community, that gets them really excited and that helps to build their capacity to uh, potentially be a, a leader in their neighborhood. So, for example, I was working in Bowling Green, Ohio, and uh, one of the things that we wanted to do that we heard from the community is that there, there's a real lack of bicycle infrastructure and it's an unsafe bike environment, especially from the BGSU campus to the downtown area. Okay. So for an early action project, we went in and installed temporary bike lanes along the main street, connecting those two places. And we worked with the students of BGSU to come out and paint all the bike lanes and to help like set everything up. And then we worked with the, another class from BGSU to create all of this um, kind of like street furniture, benches and planters. So they, they like from really recycled materials 
And then all that stuff after the after the event got auctioned off and the money helped to go to a, a local park. But they took an active role in that project in a way that was where they were able to roll up their sleeves and, and get down to business. And I think that's what young people are looking for. It's like, you know, we all spend so much time on our screens and right. doing these Zoom calls, but uh, there's something to be said about getting out into the field and actually planting a community garden or working on a project that you can point to and say, like, I was involved in this playground or uh, whatever it was. So, yeah, that, that, that's a big part of trying to broaden the, the age gap. But then there's also the, the, um, like the language gap. I work in a lot of uh, Latino communities here in Chicago and elsewhere where we have to conduct the whole process in Spanish. And that's the only way you're going to get people involved. So I have to bring in partners that I know and trust and do a great job to help lead that effort. Um, and for there, there you have other issues in, in, in regards of like the cultural, um, the cultural, I guess, aspects of being involved in something where they come from. This is not something you do. You don't, you don't get involved in a, in a government sponsored plan. They're never mm -hmm. asked to do that. And then you have the added layers of, you know, many of them are undocumented. So they feel reluctant to step mm -hmm. into the limelight and be part of a process like this because they, they're always uneasy about um, being exposed in that way. So mm -hmm. there's a, like a whole range of different challenges to getting people invested and involved in, in this, guy, this type of planning work. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it goes back to what we talked about earlier that, um, you know, it's definitely not just learning policy. Right. And then. Um, it's also not just learning creative execution, you know, how do I make sure that I draw something or do a rendering of something like there's all the stuff that happens in the margins of those and, and in between where disciplines come together that has to do with just the nuancing, right? And the the understanding people yeah, yeah. and then adapting to like, oh, wow, like you actually don't like me empowering you in this case doesn't look like putting you in the spotlight. That would actually be the opposite of what you want. So how do right. I empower you still though, and not just say, okay, well then I guess you're not part of the process. Yeah. I think, I think that's key is really maintaining flexibility through the process. So, you know, we get, we get hired by a city or housing authority and you have to, you know, you have to have your scope of services and your, um, all of your hours laid out to different tasks and all that stuff. But I just use that as a jumping off point. I think like once the project really gets going, you need to be able to turn on a dime and say, well, that didn't work. Let's try a different approach over here. Because if not, you get stuck in this like this rut where you're only doing it one way and you're not you're not achieving uh, any like real significant results. So I'm a real proponent of like letting the letting the what you hear in the engagement and the process, like letting that lead to the next step of of um, of what you're gonna do. So um, yeah, I, I think that that's a that's a key part for sure. Well, and I mean, we've got, we're all experiencing right now, here we are in the middle of a, of a global pandemic and things are actually surging right now as it gets colder. Um, I've got to think that the way that communities look and are shaped in the future are going to somewhat be impacted by this. You know, I mean, I think we're all hopeful and looking forward to the fact that it won't always be that we have to be separated and, you know, yeah. indoor yeah. dining is not an option, but um, I would be really curious after 20 years of doing this kind of work, you know, are there some things that you're pointing to the future and thinking, okay, post COVID-19, we are going to adapt and have learned things about how communities are planned or, or how people interact or don't interact. Like, is any of that going to shape even future projects? Do you think? In the, in the neighborhoods that I work that you have also the added challenge of the front of the digital divide. So that neighborhood I've mentioned in Rock Hill, South Carolina, 25% of the households do not have internet access in that community. So you couldn't even do this if you wanted to. Um, right. And I don't know how they're dealing with remote learning during all that. So thinking about like how to address that issue is a, is a really important one. But I think as we go forward and, and see like the next wave of urban regeneration after COVID, I think we're gonna see a lot more flexible spaces so if somebody's building something, uh, you know, in a commercial corridor in Cincinnati or in Chicago, and traditionally, you know, they would have some maybe retail space on the ground floor and some housing above. I think that's going to get all mixed up now where that retail space on the ground floor could be housing. It could be 
an office space. It could be, you know, a co-working space. It could be a maker space. Um, but being able to kind of open the book to create that, those flexible spaces that can adapt to change. Mm-hmm. Because, you know, I see it in my neighborhood. The restaurants are closing. Even some of the chains are closing. We have a lot of vacant space along the corridors now. And the only way to fill that is going to be to um, be able to adapt to the needs of users. So people like you and me may not need to commute downtown anymore for our project. We could walk down the block to the end of the street and, you know, work out of a small, a small co-working space that's on the ground floor of, of a building. Or, if, you know, if you live in a high rise, maybe there's a co-working space designed into that facility as an amenity. Um, so things are going to happen, I think, at the neighborhood scale a lot more and, and a little bit less at the, at the broader regional scale. So we'll see. We'll see if I'm right on that. But yeah. <laughs> Do you think that I mean, I could see that happening, too. Do you think that's a result of kind of people coming to realize that they could do it? Or is there going to be um, less infrastructure to support going to do that kind of thing? Like, what do you think will be the I, I agree there's something to yeah. this idea of like people are going to probably stay more local neighborhood right. based for their day to day. What do you think's the human element behind that? I think even before COVID, we were seeing a real strong like shop local, work local, or kind of approach to keeping mm-hmm. dollars in communities. And I think that coming out of COVID, it's going to be even more apparent and more important. But it's also going to be a lifestyle thing where um, people realize they don't need to do a 45-minute commute anymore. And maybe they need to go into the office once a week or whatever it is. Uh, to check in with with their with their group or their team, and I think the importance of like of spaces like uh, coffee shops and places like that where you can have informal gatherings are going to become even more um, important overall. So I, I just see that that whole that whole uh, kind of feel of neighborhoods changing, and the the issue is that the the laws on the books are old fashioned. You know, zoning laws are all about separating uses. So it's, you have your housing over here, you have your industrial over here, you have your office over here. And so I think, I think we're going to be, um, we're going to be seeing that change where people are going to be living, working and playing within like a, you know, a mile radius of their homes a lot more than what we've seen in the past. Which also makes it interesting just to think about, you know, transportation projects that had been the big focus of of funding and things like that. Like, I guess there probably is still a need for a bullet train that can get you from, you know, somewhere in the Midwest to another Midwestern city quicker. That kind of thing will yeah. still be necessary. Yeah. But if we're thinking about local transportation, like, you know, getting to making your downtown commute faster and quicker might not be as important anymore. Well, that, that's something that we, we, we deal with here in Chicago. We have a great public transportation system, but it's all hub and spoke based. So all the lines converge on the loop. Mm-hmm. And if you're not going to the loop, you have to go, you have to take like transfer to two trains to get where you're going. So for example, like I, I live in the Lakeview neighborhood, uh, which is near Wrigley Field. If I want to go to the Wicker Park neighborhood, which is really only about two miles away, uh, but kind of on the west side, I need to, I need to go all the way downtown and then all the way back out. Because we oh, didn't wow. design our, our transit infrastructure uh, like they did in, in more European cities where it's multimodal, where you can kind of, you can, uh, there's many opportunities to transfer and to, to get to feed in different areas. So it'll be interesting to see how that potentially adapts in the future when you don't have this huge crush of millions of people going to the, just to the loop every day, mm-hmm. um, where they're, they're going to be going to different neighborhood business areas to, to do their work. But I think like uh, the, the transportation you mentioned about like bullet trains connecting regions is still going to be incredibly important. Um, and something that I've like, I've been, I'm a train guy. So I, I've been a big proponent of high speed rail for a long time. Um, especially in like regions like the Midwest where you could, you could potentially get on a train in Chicago and be in Cincinnati in like three or four hours without mm-hmm. having to deal with the airport, um, downtown to downtown, like, even the, the micromodal transportation, like here in Chicago, we're seeing probably the same thing in Cincinnati, all of these electric scooters that you can rent now. 
Yeah. Where you can just, you can check them out. You can go like 10 blocks and then leave it there. Like that, yeah. that, that changes things a little bit. It, it gets you like beyond your walking radius, but not mm-hmm. quite to like having to get on a bus or a train to go somewhere far. So, right. so it's just, it's, it's interesting to see how, how that uh, will influence how people get around their communities in the future. Well, in, in thinking about too, um, all the, all the stuff that you've described involves a that human element, but then also bringing in like there's not just again it's not just policy, um, it's not just landscaping. It's there's there's um, you know environmental graphics that are involved. There's wayfinding and you know all these graphical elements. There's even you know one could argue that there's user experience. You know not digital user experience, but like the user yeah. of a space, you know, all of that. So it, it goes back to that same idea of how like all these disciplines, once you get out here and you're trying to solve messy problems, um, it's not just about the the thing you learned in your major classes, right? <laughs> no, no, definitely. It, you know, I'll go into a community and the, the thing that that we realize is that the, the brand for the neighborhood is is so negative because no one ever tells the positive stories about that area nothing's ever been done to, pr- to kind of like promote the community. So creating a community branding package, which gets into the wayfinding and the signage and where are the gateways into the neighborhood and how does it make you feel and how does it, how does it really uh, create a unified look? Um, that's becoming more and more important overall. And that it's something that's out of the uh, toolbox of, of most urban planners. So bringing in the expertise to do that kind of work and, and knowing that um, it's important to, to interact with the different disciplines to get those perspectives on how that should be done uh, is really critical. Yeah. Was there any um, sort of, you know, elder wisdom uh, that you would give to a student who's, you know, in DAP right now or in any design program and thinking about like, okay, I want to use this, these skills and these tools that I'm getting, I want to use them to impact my community or a community, somebody else, even, you know, not just necessarily as a city planner, even, but they just, they want to harness that and do something. I think there's so much tension and angst in the world right now because of a lot of things we've experienced over the last, you know, months and years. And um, I I sense that this, there's a lot of students who are looking at, I'm investing these times in myself and in being in school and learning all these things, but what am I going to go do with them? Right? Like there's this world that I can go out into and I can choose to use these to go make money in a job, which I probably need to, but there's also like, you know, how do I take the best of what I'm learning right now and go do something in my community with it? Yeah. I always tell young people and students that I meet that it's all about communication. So learning how to, talk to people and interact with people and, and, you know, facilitate conversations. And, and that goes from, you know, a, a guy that you meet on the street all the way up to the mayor of a city that you're sitting down at a table with and being comfortable in communicating. But then the other side of communication is the visual design communication of to being, a, being able to ex- express your ideas in a way that people can really understand. Uh, for example, I was in Rock Hill last week and I, I you know, I had several days of interviews with all sorts of community members and, and elected officials and everything. So I had, I came out of it with like, a, you know, 30 pages of notes. Well, I was able to, to take all of what I heard and distill it down into a one page graphic that really, um, really summarized all the key points and the key elements of what we heard. It showed the interconnectedness of them. And then being able to, to share that back to the community and the clients and and then they see, well, you really listened to us. You heard what we, what we said uh, and, and communicating that in a way that is easy to understand. Um, so whatever you're doing, whether it's, you know, designing a, a, an 80 story skyscraper or designing a bus shelter, like you have to be able to communicate those design ideas in a way that are, is clear, but also gets people um, interested in supporting that project. Um, and I see that I'm also the, the neighborhood, the, the president of my neighborhood association here in Chicago. So I sit at the other side of the table a lot where we have architects and developers and whoever coming in to propose projects in our community and looking for feedback. And the way that they communicate the projects is usually very poor. They're, they're, they're talking about all of these kind of head down technical details of the floor plan and 
you know, all, all this kind of stuff that, that people don't really care about or really understand. And they miss the big picture of, of how to tell the story about why that, why that development or that design is going to be good for the community. And then having the visuals to support that story, I think is, is really critical. So that, that's usually the, what I try to share with, uh, with younger students is those communication skills. Yeah. Yeah. Story. I mean, I, you know, I've talked about story and digital storytelling and all of that. And um, that's, that's the element that it's so exciting when you see that unlock um, because you can talk about story and it has to be felt almost more yeah. than just heard. Right. And so right. when, when I see students start to get it and recognize that the way that they structure even their PowerPoint presentation, you know, has to do with the way you're going to unfold a story and, once they get it, you see the impact of it when they give that presentation or or people sort of feel like they're a part of this vision that's being cast versus just being talked at, you know? Yeah, yeah, definitely. It, and whenever I go in for a project interview, um, you know, I don't, I, don't, I, I don't do like a 45 minute PowerPoint presentation and then say like, all right, does anybody have any questions? I would say like my second slide is asking them a question or even like passing out a lot of times I'll, I have these little uh, keypad polling things and I'll, I'll say like, all right, enough about me. Like what we're going to do. So your, your RFP talks about these four challenges in the community. What do you think is the, the, the biggest challenge that we need to overcome through this project and, and having them kind of vote in real time. And then we have a conversation and jumping right into that, building that relationship, whether it's with a client or a community right off the bat, um, nobody likes to be talked to or lectured at. It, it needs to become something that's much more back and forth and that you're reacting to what they say, whether it's designing a product or whatever it is, but you need to be able to kind of think on your feet as well to follow that conversation, follow the threads and uh, to be able to kind of keep it going. Well, I feel like we've covered a lot of ground and talked about different cities and transportation yeah. modalities and layouts and age ranges like there's a lot here is there is there anything we haven't talked about that you're excited to share or a story you wanted to tell or anything like that oh man um no i mean i i think that i guess the the one thing that that i'd love to kind of hit on is just people that are interested in doing what i'm doing which is starting their own practice and being entrepreneurs and kind of you know, jumping into the deep end I, I've, um, I've been really, it's only been about nine months or so, but I, um, I've been really happy with the way it's going. And I think that, and I've actually had a lot of friends and colleagues contact me thinking about doing the same thing, which mm -hmm. is kind of moving away from that, the approach of, all right, you're part of a big company and moving into like, all right, you're going into business for yourself and you're, you're going to, um, you're going to kind of express your, your mission through your work in a way that's really authentic but but doing it i think more and more people are interested in doing that I, and part of that might be coming out of COVID. there have been a lot of layoffs and a lot of other things going on and everybody's working at home anyway now it's like well hey like i could just do this from home right. i could be a contract worker i can do whatever and i think i think that's going to be the next stage of at least our profession is a lot more people doing what i'm doing and uh, kind of betting on themselves, but also you, the only way you can do it is with a strong network of of connections and people to collaborate with. So, mm -hmm. you know, I, I've built that network over 20 years, and I think that's something that young people need to understand as well as, you know, you never burn bridges. You always, you always try to connect other people, even if you can't help out with things. And that, that helps you really um, get into that that mindset that we're all working together towards common goals. So, I, I think that's another another thing that we're going to see a lot of is is designers and planners and, and people like us going off on our own and and um, and really starting our own thing coming out of this. Yeah, now I can see that. Yeah, there's just a mindset of like not necessarily betting on the system as much anymore, recognizing like, you know, just the same way we've all had to kind of band together and say, how are we going to take care of our families or our communities and, and, and having to rely on each other for that. Um, I can see how that would eventually translate over to into like, well, it might be the case for what I do economically, you know, to make a yeah. viable living. <laughs> yeah. And thanks for staying connected with, with UC and with DAP and everything. And, um, you know, it'd be exciting to see what the projects are and 
Um, you said it's Collabo, right? Yeah. Uh, so my website is collaboplanning.com. Um, and my, my email is adam at collaboplanning.com. So yeah, if, if any of your listeners are interested in um, talking about how they can improve their neighborhoods or their communities or anything like that, you know, I'm, I'm always willing to, to jump in and, and help out. Perfect. Well, that's the ultimate setup for more collaboration, right? So yeah, you got to yeah. share it. Don't hide it. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. Thank you, Adam. Thanks so much. And, um, you know, we want to thank everybody who's continued to listen and tune in and check us out um, on all the different platforms. Um, thank you, Cincinnati Bell, for making this possible. Cincinnati Bell is an amazing sponsor. They take care of so many things that we don't have the technical expertise to do, and they give us a platform to, to show this and share it with everybody. So um, thank you, Cincinnati Bell, and um, thank you to everybody who's continuing to stay engaged in the story. We look forward to continuing to share more stories like this. Um, please do check us out on all the social media channels and uh, feel free to like and interact with us and tell us topics or people that we should be talking to because this is all about helping um, each other share stories. So thanks, and we will see you next time. 